I don't think. Um, if you go in the, I'm going to have some assignments I'm going to put up tomorrow. So don't worry if you haven't seen there's not, not upcoming assignments, but they're based upon topics that uh, we've been doing. So in the materials section for the course, you'll find the uh, biological oceanography and there's the plan for the week. And in that plan for the week, um, I described there about the clownfish life cycle thing that I showed you about yesterday. And then uh, there's a link here for this uh, PowerPoint slide deck about life of coral. And uh, I wanna sh go through some of this today and tell you about like coral reefs and locations where there's coral and how it relates to all the things we've studied in this class up until now. But then in the plan for the week, and I'll show you this at the end here too, there's a, hold on, let me share this screen. There we go. Okay, so in the plan for the week, uh, for today, Tuesday, January 5th, um, there's that PowerPoint that says the life of coral PowerPoint. I'm gonna go through some of that stuff today. And then it says, watch these two videos. So normally if we're live in class, I would show these videos and talk about some stuff, uh, but it, the video just doesn't look good and come through well through the Zoom. So like when I play the uh, YouTube video through the Zoom, it's just not good. So at the end, uh, in where it says for today, January 5th, I want you to watch each of these two. They're short. They're only, you know, this one's like four minutes and this one's like seven minutes or something like that. And actually the, the first one's the most important one and they talk about it. The second one is just a dive video. It's a video that has underwater videography showing like incredibly exceptionally um, beautiful coral reefs that are around um, Indonesia. So anyway, uh, coral reefs, let me get this screen up and going. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make this look like I want it to look because yeah, I just can't, it's okay. If you, uh, if you download or you click on this Life of Coral, it goes through in the same kind of way. Um, I can't really share the screen in the same way that I'd want to as a full screen, but I can get pretty close. Let me see, keynote, share, take a look, chat. Okay. Oh, not in this meeting. Okay, good. That's fine. Just had a message. Okay, so I know that there's stuff on the side. Um, this is a picture of a coral reef aquarium. And actually the colors have been uh, like saturated a little bit further than is realistic. But, um, you know, we keep coral in our aquariums here at school, but coral live in oceans all over the world. And when you watch those two videos, it'll take you through some different ideas uh, about places where there are coral reefs. So looking at the map of the world, uh, there's the world's ocean, which, you know, is, uh, covers most of the planet itself, but the tropical zone, which in this map is the green stripe is the area between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And the equator is right in the middle of that tropical zone. And, uh, so there's this tropical waters of the earth, which surround the, uh, which are like a belt around the equator of the earth and marked in yellow are the locations of the world's coral reefs and uh, coral reefs are incredibly important resources in the world's ocean. It's they're like the rainforest of the ocean. So in biology class, if you studied rainforests, you know, there are areas on land with incredible diversity of uh, plant and animal life. Uh, they're very, very critical, um, habitats for a diverse amount of species. They're oftentimes homes and birthplaces of uh, animals that then travel to other places on the earth. And it's the same with coral reefs. Coral reefs have an incredible density of life in a very small area and very uh, unique life. So coral reefs are much more spectacular in a lot of ways than much of the world's rest of the ocean. Like the middle of the ocean in the Atlantic on the ocean floor is just uh, well, there, there's life and there's diversity, but it's not nearly as dense in terms of life. So coral reefs are very uh, particularly cool. Most of the world's coral reefs are actually in the Pacific Ocean, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, north of Australia, in through Indonesia, New Guinea, 
huge amount of coral reef uh, here between really like Australia and mainland of uh, Africa, but or uh, Asia. But there are coral reefs around Africa in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, in through the Indian Ocean, off the east coast of uh, South America. For the United States, there are coral reefs around in the um, in the Caribbean. There's one reef off the coast of uh, Florida, um, along the Florida Keys, and then the U.S. Virgin Islands, of course, and then around the state of Hawaii and some other U.S. Ter territories. So the amount of reefs off the United States aren't as spectacular as the number of reefs that are in other parts of the world. So looking at Australia, uh, we've already talked about this Great Barrier Reef a few times. Off the northeast coast of Australia exists a very long and huge reef called the Great Barrier Reef. Great because it's large, barrier reef because it's off the shore, uh, off some shallow water, acting in a way as a barrier between land and very deep water. And it's not one continuous reef, but there's a huge, it's a huge reef. Um, we talked about how Australia moves as a continent. So as a result of the motion of uh, Australia, it has dragged the reef over an enormous amount of area. And there, the thing about reefs is they exist in places where the water of the earth is very warm, gets a lot of direct sunlight, and is actually relatively nutrient poor. So you're looking for reefs that are actually, or areas of water where the uh, uh, water is relatively nutrient poor. So when we talked about nutrient rich water, nutrient rich water exists whenever there's usually upwelling of cool water bringing nutrients from deep in the ocean to the surface. And coral doesn't like cold water and it also likes nutrient poor water. So oftentimes these reefs exist in areas where there's warm water currents coming from nutrient poor areas. When I say nutrient, I'm talking about like phosphates and nitrates and dead plant and animal material. Those in general are uh, high in nutrient. The water around coral reefs is very, very like clean and pure, I guess you could say. So here off the coast of Australia, there's a, a warm water current uh, which travels uh, uh, from the north to the south, which we already looked at in uh, current activity that comes from the Indian Ocean. And it's a warm water current, which uh, is actually a warm water current, which travels all the way across the equator, across the Pacific Ocean, and then heads south down through uh, Indonesia and then along the coast of Australia. So that's one current. In off the coast of the United States, you also know that there's this current which flows up along the East Coast, the Gulf Stream. And that Gulf Stream is a warm water current which comes from the Caribbean Sea up along like uh, East Coast of Florida and then up along uh, the coast. It's a relatively warm water current which has this circulation kind of in the clockwise pattern in the Northern Hemisphere. and this water that comes up through the Caribbean as low nutrient water, it's warm water that has traveled across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean along the equator. There's a, off the east coast of the United States, there is what's called the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this is the southern tip of mainland Florida. And off the southern tip of mainland Florida is a series of islands called the Florida Keys. And the terminology in Florida about keys is a key is a, just an island. Uh, and those islands are all connected here in this, in this illustration. There are all these like black dots and black lines. And there's a highway which runs uh, from Miami down to where the highway goes onto the keys. And that island or that highway goes all the way down to uh, Key West. And let's see, Key West is right down here. Let's see if I can find it. Key West National. Yeah. I guess it's on there, Key West. So there's an overseas highway which runs all the way down to Key West. And it turns out that the Keys themselves used to be a coral reef. Uh, but the Keys themselves are not the reef anymore. The reef now exists underwater off the east coast of the Keys. So the location of most of the coral, uh, there's this uh, big reef here called Carey's Fort Reef, which is off of Key Largo. And uh, it's like eight miles from Key Largo through water to Carey's Fort Reef. There's also these other small reefs that are all the way along here. But basically along this dotted line are the location of the remaining reefs. So here's the thing that's really incredible about the reefs off of Florida. The 
existing reefs are just these little pink spots that exist uh, on this map. They don't take up a lot of area. They're not particularly large. In the recent past, those reefs were the Florida Keys. So the Florida Keys themselves are all built out of calcium carbonate built by coral. Even more remarkable than that is the entire state of Florida was once a submerged reef. So on a bigger scale, if we look at Florida as it exists today, this is the whole state of Florida. Most all of Florida was one giant coral reef that was underwater. As that reef got lifted up, the remaining reef was just the Florida Keys. And now the only remaining reef are these very small reefs that exist off the Keys underwater in Florida itself. So in the past, we had pretty remarkably large uh, reefs off of the southeast coast of the United States, but not anymore. So here's how you can see about how deep or how shallow the water is around Florida and where our reefs are. Um, Whenever the ocean level was lower, uh, about 18,000 years ago, the coast of the United States was a significantly larger amount of area. In other words, 18,000 years ago, the coast of the United States was this boundary between the yellow and the blue. Uh, so this is actually very shallow water. We already studied like water depth off the coast of Florida in the um, Gulf of Mexico and off the East Coast relatively very shallow water. So if you were to raise up Florida or drop sea levels by about 125 meters, you get all this much more land, which is a remarkable amount of land. Right now, the state of Florida is the shape like that. Um, that's where the water and the land meet. If you were to raise ocean levels by only five meters, that's 15 feet. That's how much of Florida gets covered by the ocean. So what that means is all of this part of Florida, down here in the Everglades, Miami, all the Keys, um, up here along where like uh, Daytona Beach, Jacksonville, that all goes underwater if you raise ocean levels just 15 feet, which is like uh, the height of a one-story garage or the height of a one-story house. It's the height of three people. So you can see that most of Florida is actually incredibly shallow or incredibly like low lying. And uh, it wouldn't have taken that much water to have immersed Florida. It's also a thing to notice that as sea levels rise more and more Florida gets kind of eaten up, uh, especially in low lying coastal areas. And I'll show you a thing about that with a problem that exists in Miami um, right at the end of the course, because we'll look at changes in the ocean and how things might be effective in the future. If you go even further, if you raise ocean levels by 50 meters, so that's about 150 feet, which is a lot more significant rise. The only parts of Florida, I guess, that are left are just these few high points um, <clears throat> scattered about in mainland Florida. So it's not really actually surprising to know or to learn that the locations of the reefs in Florida have changed significantly in the recent past. Coral requires very shallow water that's bright, that's warm, and low nutrient. And it turns out that this area of Florida, if it gets immersed, is actually a perfect home for coral. But whenever it becomes high and dry on land, the coral can't make it. Uh, other places where coral exists is around the islands in Hawaii. So uh, the Hawaiian islands stick up in the Pacific Ocean, but there are coral reefs that surround many of the islands and some of them it's relatively close. Uh, there's a image here that shows like all the different diversity of fish that exist off the uh, uh, Hawaiian islands. We keep some Hawaiian fish in our aquariums like yellow tangs. Uh, we have a convict tang in the classroom. In the, uh, this tang or this fish up here is the humu humu trigger. There's one of these fish that's in the library aquarium. There's also a number of different kinds of sharks and rays and uh, uh, monk seals and spinner dolphins around Hawaii. So the Hawaiian islands, because of their diverse reefs and both shallow and deep water host a huge variety of uh, reef creatures. So near shore 
uh, we've dealt with things like tides and currents and waves. And in order for coral to live well, you have to have constant water motion because coral are animals that are sessile. They can't move. So you have to take the food to them and take their waste away. And it turns out that oftentimes around these reefs, there's usually not only high speed currents which flow, but also uh, waves that crash over relatively shallow water. And in this illustration, this is like a idea of the what would be the ocean floor from the shore going down to deep water as the coral lives, it builds more and more limestone. So the reef grows up, but can also grow away from land. So oftentimes in these areas where there's reefs, there's usually a huge amount of this reef limestone, which can sometimes be, you know, hundreds of feet tall. And uh, the reef can be relatively shallow out to a huge distance until the reef drops off. And there are different types of coral which live in the shallow water. Other types of coral live where the reef crest is, where the reef drops off. And then there are also uh, shell or deep water coral that don't require as much light and, uh, you know, just survive in different ways. So oftentimes even on a reef, there's a diversity of different kinds of coral. And within coral, there are different types of coral. So uh, usually we do a whole bunch of work with coral, like when we're in school, if we come back for the last two weeks of the marking period, we'll do work in, you know, by hand with things with coral uh, in the classroom. We'll frag coral, I'll show you different types of coral. We'll do work with coral. If we're not together, uh, even still, whenever you do come back to school, if you do ever come back to school here, uh, you, you can see the different types of coral and identify them in the aquarium. So not all coral actually builds solid skeleton. There's an entire class of coral called soft coral. And we keep a lot of coral that looks like this in a bunch of our aquariums. Usually it's kind of pinkish in color. And uh, this whole type of coral called soft coral are coral that uh, build a structure, but it's a soft structure. It's usually kind of rubbery or leathery feeling. And uh, they oftentimes have branches which come out and they wave and move around. So in aquariums, it's somewhat nice to have coral that has some kind of motion. And uh, in the aquarium trade, it's easier to keep soft coral. Uh, they're more resilient. They don't have as high requirements with calcium and magnesium. And beginners like to keep these kind of coral. And some people just appreciate having soft coral aquariums. So one of the aquariums in our hallway, the 125 gallon aquarium, uh, it's entirely mostly just Kenya tree soft coral. Um, and it moves around and you see the fish swimming in and among and around it. Another kind of coral you'll see are these kind of coral called mushroom coral. And there's a huge variety of shapes and colors and sizes. They're usually about the size of a quarter. The really big ones can be like, uh, I don't know, about four inches across. And these are also uh, soft coral that usually live on surfaces. Um, and they just end up splitting on their own. We have a lot of the ones that look exactly like this one, like the greenish one. We grow those, uh, but you'll see in different aquariums, these different types of soft coral. They don't leave skeleton behind and they don't require uh, calcium. The coral that build the reefs, which we did with chemical oceanography, are stony coral. And there's two types of stony coral. We call them small polyp stony coral, or in, in this, uh, in the study of coral, they're called SPS. SPS stands for small polyp stony coral because the individual coral polyps themselves are very small, uh, you know, a couple millimeters across and they grow in different shapes. This is a kind of coral called an acropora coral or staghorn coral. Uh, we keep a bunch of, these are pictures, this is a picture from in our aquariums. Uh, another type of small polyp stony coral are these bird's nest coral called bird's nest because just like how a bird builds a nest with leaves and twigs and stuff that are all kind of locked in together and intermixed. Uh, this coral as it grows tries to have a huge amount of surface area um, but they're all kind of like intertwined and mixed. So that's a we have you know about a half a dozen different types of bird's nest coral of different colors. We've got green and yellow and purple and pink like this one. 
And then some coral grow out on flat plates. And we've specialized here in growing a lot of this Montipara coral. And you don't have to know the names of all this. Oh, that shouldn't say bird's nest. It's just called Monty coral. It's also a small polyp coral, but it grows out in these flat plates. And when it does that, it tries to get as much surface area as it can and also shades coral below it. And this is a coral that's in one of our aquariums. And then uh, besides the small polyp ones, there are large polyp stony coral. And the large polyp coral, the polyps can be bigger, like almost the size of a, a dime or a penny. Uh, those polyps themselves are larger in size and usually build larger colonies. So we'll work with this type of coral. This is a kind of coral called a chalice coral. And uh, that one's actually called uh, Sprung's Hollywood Stunner Chalice. And we propagate a lot of that. Each one of the yellow circles itself is an individual polyp. Um, if we're remote next week, I'm going to use a microscope and show you under the microscope different samples of different types of coral uh, through the video, the sizes of the polyps and how the polyps are diverse. If we're in school, you're going to see it like in person with your own eyes. But here you can see that there's a clownfish there, kind of like in this coral. Uh, this is one from one of our aquariums here. And the polyps are bigger, but there's still flesh between the individual polyps. So the corals themselves are animals. It's one of the biggest myths in oceanography is that coral are plants. And part of that comes from the idea that like these uh, um, soft polyp corals, or soft corals look like plants because they kind of grow like plants. They're soft like plants. And in the history of biology, um, people considered coral to be plants for a long time because it's well known that they require light and without light they can't grow much like a plant but here's the secret uh, and I, this may have come up in other times in the class before in other ways that's so cool is the individual polyp itself the individual coral itself is an animal but then living within the cells of the animal are um, algae and that algae is generically called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae literally means a plant within an animal. Zo, referring to uh, animal, it's pronounced zo, not zoo. If you will say zoo, but it's pronounced zo. So, like when you go to a zoo, it's okay to call it a zoo, but it's literally like a zoological park. So it's pronounced zo, not zoo. But anyway. Zoxanthellae, the zo means animal, and the the uh, xanthellae is a plant within. So zoxanthellae literally means plants within animals. So within the cells of the animals, which are transparent cells, live algae. So it's a commensurate relationship, kind of like the anemone in the clownfish. The uh, coral provides a home for the zoxanthellae. And you know that algae or plants need carbon dioxide. So the coral polyp itself as a waste product produces carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is exactly what the uh, algae needs to undergo photosynthesis. And then also uh, the photosynthesis produces sugars, which are used by the algae, but then excess energy from the... Uh, sugars from the algae go to feed the animal. So some coral don't require any food besides the energy that's provided from the algae that's within their cells. But many anemones also have stinging cells and an individual mouth. So these tentacles which stick out from most uh, coral can capture food from the water, feed themselves. They have a gastric cavity, much like a stomach, where they can digest the food. Uh, all the while that coral is building skeleton and that skeleton allows the colony to grow larger in size and to grow closer toward the sun. So it's a remarkable relationship and we've only truly understood the relationship between coral and the zooxanthellae which live within their cells in relatively recent time. And a lot of that research comes from uh, what we do in aquariums. So aquarists are just as responsible for understanding the role of fish and coral as uh, biologists who study the coral like directly in the ocean or in situ. 
So uh, that's like what I just said. The out energy comes from food collected from the tentacles and from zooxanthellae, but coral can't move. So it turns out all the food and the light and the water has to be brought to them. And then their waste is taken away by the currents and the uh, waves. So two ways that coral reproduce is they can just split themselves. They undergo asexual reproduction. So like the anemones, they'll split themselves in half. Coral will split themselves in half. They just literally make a clone of themselves. The polyp will just cleave itself in the middle and make a reproduced one of itself. Uh, we grow a lot of coral here at school. And when we say we grow coral, all of that coral growth is always asexual. They can also undergo uh, sexual reproduction. And I'll show you about spawning events uh, next week, uh, maybe later this week, about coral spawning. So that's another remarkable story that coral also uh, release um, reproductive cells and do broadcast spawning. That's a very unusual event. And it doesn't really happen in our aquariums, although in sometimes in research it does. So the relationship between the zooxanthellae and the coral is the zooxanthellae uses sunlight, water, and uh, this should say carbon dioxide, I gotta fix that, to conduct photosynthesis. And then the uh, waste product of the zooxanthellae includes oxygen whenever photosynthesis is taking place, and that's an additional oxygen for the uh, coral. I gotta fix that. So um, coral can get stressed, and one of the challenges we have in keeping saltwater aquariums is preventing that stress from happening. In the oceans, the stress that happens to coral uh, causes the coral to wanna leave the structure. And there's a phenomenon known as coral bleaching. And you can read all kinds of stuff about coral bleaching online. And it's one of the things that is like the canary in the coal mine, the indicator that things are not going well in the oceans is when in and around a coral reef, the uh, coral leaves the surface of the uh, structure that it's living on, all of a sudden the coral will look totally white. So in this picture that's down here is living coral on the left and this colony here has bleached itself. And because all the individual polyps are connected, they will like chemically signal to each other, it's time to go, we gotta leave. So in a way it's like a, uh, well, what they do first is they expel their zooxanthellae. They sort of almost like commit suicide. The individual polyps will say, uh, I just gotta get rid of all the zooxanthellae in my cells. So the cells themselves, the coral will expel or get rid of the algae that's the very, food provider for themselves. They do that when they're stressed. And sometimes they can survive that, but then typically the polyps themselves will just leave. They'll leave the surface of the uh, coral and go somewhere else to live. And why it's called bleaching is that what's left behind is that bright white, uh, the bright white uh, coral structure that it had. And that bleaching takes place in our aquariums. Uh, sometimes whenever the coral gets stressed, it'll bleach. And that stress can come from a number of factors. The pH could drop too low and it can never get too high, really. Uh, extremely cold water, extremely high water, uh, high nutrient load. Another thing that happens is coral can get disease. And if coral gets disease, that disease can oftentimes spread through the entire colony and kill all of the animals. And in that diseasing process, uh, the uh, coral can end up bleaching. So this is a good example. Uh, there's some, this is in, in the ocean. These are some three striped damselfish, a little damselfish up here and here. And uh, this is a, an acropora coral. The body of the acropora coral is usually kind of brownish in color. The new growth tips are this nice purple color. So this is where the coral is growing out to grow additional branches. And I can tell that this coral is in really good health and really good shape because there's really good uh, growth, lots of nubbins on the ends. But the coral here has bleached itself. It's hard to say. Um, it could be as a result of disease, high pH. Sometimes uh, there are, are starfish that will eat coral and fish that will eat coral. As soon as the fish comes along and begins to eat on the colony, that'll cause the bleaching to take place. But that's a very stereotypical picture of um, coral bleaching. In some places of the world's ocean, that bleaching event can take place over huge areas. Sometimes entire reefs, like the sizes of a football field, will just all up and bleach all in one shot. And the coral can be restored. Um, sometimes those polyps from one coral 
will leave and then land on another place and then re repopulate that existing uh, reef. Sometimes there's little mysteries like we'll collect coral from the ocean and it it's like the wrong species living on a completely different surface. And we even happens in our aquariums where sometimes like this bird or this montipora coral uh, will actually like bleach and leave this surface and then land on this surface and cover the surface of this existing skeleton with like sort of the wrong species, but then eventually turn into the right sort of shape and structure. So uh, these individual polyps grow relatively slowly and the structure of the coral can take a long time to grow. It requires an awful lot of patience, far slower gro growth than plants on land, but there's a constant renewal of the reefs as uh, old coral die and bleach and a new coral come in to take their place. Um, and corals always competing with other coral for space and for light, but the coral provides a home for baby fish, provides nice protection. Um, the colors can just be like stunning. So anyway, this is in there and we're gonna do more stuff with different types of coral as we work along through the course. But this first video, uh, let me switch. I gotta share a different screen. So what I want you to do is, let's see, 121. There's like 11 minutes left. Uh, between today and tomorrow, and tomorrow we're not gonna be in class very long either. But between today and tomorrow, I want you to uh, watch those uh, two videos. I'll show you where they are again real quick. Um, really, the first one's the one I really want you to watch. And the second one, I'll just show you just a little bit real quick. So in the plan for the week, this water coral reefs and what's their purpose, I want you to watch that video and you can watch it now. But the second one is one that's also optional. Um, I'll just show you like what it looks like. But basically, it's like a dive video, a video showing... Um, like what it looks like on reefs. And this particular reef happens to be a reef that's in Indonesia. I didn't want to click that. And I don't want this ad either. Skip the ads. I don't want this ad either. doesn't really matter where we go. But the second video is good because it shows you like what life on reefs really looks like. Huge numbers and very great diversities of schools of fish, some fish swimming above the reef, some swimming down in among it. Um, this is a pretty remarkable reef. These are Antheus fish and you can see different sizes and shapes of coral. You'll see eels living in among the fish, um, different kinds of shrimp, all kinds of different sorts of diversity of life and incredible colors and just spectacularly beautiful. So anyway, that's all I have for you today. Um, but watch that first video that's uh, in the plan for the week under today that says what are coral reefs and what's their purpose. And then I'll catch you tomorrow and show you stuff about coral protection and like uh, palatoxin and stuff like that. If you have questions, you can turn your mic, ask them, put them in your chat, whatever. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. deuces.